So I think the most important objection to originalism is that there are new things under the sun. That is, there are issues that confront us today that uh, could not have confronted, never did confront uh, the framers. And I mean, obviously things like plane travel were not things that the founders knew anything about. Some of the more contentious examples of this have to do with uh, unenumerated rights, say the right to abortion or to protection against punitive damages or rights that are not listed in the Constitution. Uh, how are we supposed to think about uh, those? Well, I think that the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which is the clause which seems most directed at that uh, question, uh, had a, a, a history to it which tells us that privileges and immunities are determined by long-standing uh, legal practices of the country. Thus, it's not a question of abstract moral philosophy, but rather uh, a question of long-standing custom and tradition. And then what the Privileges and Immunities Clause was designed to do is to prevent individual states from being outliers from a long-standing national moral consensus. Uh, this is the Supreme Court's logic in uh, Griswold against Connecticut having to do with the use of birth control because at the time of Griswold, virtually every state and for a very long period of time had uh, legalized the use of birth control. Uh, Connecticut was an outlier. In fact, according to Justice Harlan's concurrence, it was the only state in the Union that did purport to make the use of contraceptives by married couples uh, illegal. And so this is, I think, a perfectly classic and legitimate exercise of the interpretive power with respect to privileges and immunities to say that the, the, that the right to use birth control in that case was protected. I think that when you look at uh, other assertions of of individual rights like the right to assisted suicide or the right to same-sex marriage, uh, that there is no such consensus. Uh, there certainly is no long-standing history. Uh, and it's particularly troubling when you think about the meaning of privileges and immunities for the court to say that suddenly we have privileges and immunities to do things that have never been part of the American legal tradition. When the court is doing that, it's really just setting itself up as a moral superior to overrule uh, the decisions that uh, the representatives of the people have been making. Uh, and I don't think that's what the Privileges and Immunities Clause means, and I don't think it would ever have been adopted if that were, uh, that, that were what the people thought it means.